So, good morning, church. Thank you. Uh, let me begin with uh, Edda Peter. Uh, I know you were not expecting this. Um, because uh, today, Reverend Josiah Chomps was to preach, and because of the swap, we were discussing about uh, the songs for the day. And as they were expressing concern, I told them that they should press the key and give me a signal. And uh, they forgot. Okay, it's good to be here and uh, to bring God's word to us. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you so much for this opportunity to reflect on your love together as a community that derives its name from you. What a privilege that we are called by your name. We are grateful. Thank you for this love. Lead us into it today and help us to comprehend and be able to apply this knowledge you will give us today. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. So the topic of the sermon is abiding in the eternal love of God. Abiding in the eternal love of God. The text, however, is not what, we, what you have there, but it's Romans chapter 8, verse 28 to 39. Sorry, Romans chapter 8, verse 28 to 39. So the love of God is perhaps the commonest, one of the commonest topics preached in churches today. One would suppose that because it is frequently preached upon and discussed, it is understood and known. But this is not the case. So today's sermon is aimed at exploring the love of God and our place in it. But let me give a few remarks. One, the love of God, as we all know, is unmerited. Now these are just introductory remarks, but perhaps remind us, the love of God is unmerited. We are told that Christ died for us, even while we were still sinners. And in God, this, this part of Christ dying for us, even while we were still sinners, was just, an, according to the Bible, it was just a fulfillment of something God had in mind, but waited for each time. So Paul will tell us at the fullness of time, Christ died for sinners. But then we are told that he is the Lamb of God that was slain when? From the foundations of the earth. So even before any human existed, this love was already determined in God's mind. So it is unmerited. If this was prepared ahead of even the creation of Adam, who will claim to have merited this? Not even Adam can claim that. But then the second thing is that this love of God is transformative. And I want to read this. Uh, the love of God is also transformative. So 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 to 21. Why I'm not dwelling on it, I feel we should read it. Beloved, let us love one another, for love 
is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest amongst us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loves us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this, we know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit, and we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because he is so also, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he does not love his brother for he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must love one, must love his brother. So from where we have read, we can see that God's love is transformative. We did not love him first. He loved us first, but that love now makes us loving. God's love does not stop at loving us. If we don't become loving as a result of the love we have received, then the aim of God's love is defeated. Because as the apostle says, God's love is perfected when we, in return, love not just him, but our brothers and neighbors. So God's love is transformative. The third thing is that God's love is unfathomable. God's love is unfathomable. It is beyond understanding. It is beyond comprehension. Reverend just read for us Ephesians 3 from verse 14. And in fact, Paul had to say a special prayer for the church. And he says his prayer is that Christ will dwell in us by faith. Now, that's a basic foundation he's laying. Now, from what he's saying, if Christ does not dwell in someone by faith, then the person cannot be rooted in love. And because the person is not rooted in love, the person cannot be able to comprehend the depth, the height, 
and the width and the breadth of God's love. These are the things Paul is talking about. It's even not that even the person who is uh, who has Christ dwelling in him by faith, who is rooted in love, is able to comprehend the entire spectrum of God's love. In fact, Paul in his words there says that we may know the love of Christ that is beyond knowledge. Do you understand what he's saying? We may begin at least to grasp this. Even when we have faith, we are in Christ, we are taking root in, in love. It is at that point that we are even beginning to grasp the love that passes knowledge. This love is unsearchable. Now, this explains why people who are kind of Christians don't seem to understand the love of God. They are Christians. It explains why many people who have not grown, gone deep and become rooted in Christ don't seem to understand the love of God. Do you notice that the closer one gets to God, the more of God's love the person discovers. Now, at this time, I remember meeting uh, someone, a woman in the church I pastored before coming back to seminary church. She was not a member of the church, but she came to me and she said, Pastor, I'm here to find out one thing, just one thing. What have I done to God that he does not do anything good to me? Okay, so this lady is not capable, is not able to see God's love at all. Is it because God does not have love for her or she is incapable of comprehending God's love? Now, these are foundation stones. If they are missed, God's love will be present and yet you will not be able to see it and comprehend it. I met another woman who said, I am afraid of loving, of knowing God more, because I feel if I know him more, I will not like him. Now, here you have people who clearly, just the thought of of loving God is a problem. But this is not because God's love is not deep, not because God's love is not wide, but simply because they lack the ability to comprehend this love. And we have people like this in church. They rage against God. When circumstances put them in a tight corner, they can even throw away their faith. Because God, according to them, does not love. But God's love is unsearchable, is past finding out, but some people lack the capacity to comprehend it because there are basic foundation stones that should be in place that are not. At this point, we will turn to Romans chapter 8 to look at God's love in this passage and our place in it. From verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom 
He foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image, to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? Who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulations or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So this passage we have read talks about God's commitment, and that's our first point, God's eternal commitment of love. Verse 28. Now, the apostle speaks of what is common knowledge to the disciples. He says, we know. He does not say we think that all things work together. We know. Are you a disciple of Christ? Is this one of those things you know? Or do you think that some, point, some things work for good while some things do not? But the apostle speaks of what is common knowledge to disciples of Jesus. This we know, that all things work together. Now take note of what he says. All things also implies whenever and wherever anything happens. If something is happening whenever, wherever, in fact, however, it happens. For the disciples of Jesus, all things, God works through them for the good of those who love him. So some things may happen to us at times we feel they should not. Some things may happen in a manner we feel they should not. But if we are disciples of Christ, in all of them he works for the good of those who love him. Now, notice this is a difference in theology between the theology of the disciples of Christ and the theology of the friends of Job. You remember Job's friends. When they sat with him, they kept telling him, Job, you may have offended God. You must have offended God. 
You are claiming to be a righteous man here. But do you know everything you do? You must have offended God. And that's why this is happening. God works good for the righteous, but he works evil for all the unrighteous. This was their theology. And at the end of it, oh, God says, no, you people did not represent me well. And so I'm requiring a sacrifice for sin from you because you said of me things that should not be said of me. Even when evil, in fact, when confirmed wickedness is plotted against God's children and executed, even in it, he still works good. In the Old Testament, we have Joseph who understood this. He said, you planned this for evil, but God has turned it for good. Is this not even the lesson we learn in Christ himself? In fact, Peter the Apostle reminds us in Acts chapter 2 from verse 22 to 25, he says, men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. So even when confirmed wickedness is plotted and executed against God's children, even in that, he works good for those who love him. Now we have to remember that God is eternally committed to his purposes, which, is natural, which naturally makes him lovingly committed to the good of anyone who loves him and is committed to those purposes. Again, God is eternally committed to his purposes. And this makes him naturally, lovingly committed to anyone who is pursuing those purposes. In fact, some prosperity teachers, like Job's friends, may unknowingly be making God angry. Remember, why did they make God angry? They made God angry in an attempt to defend him, right? And some prosperity teachers may unknowingly be making God angry. But since Christ has already died, I don't know what God will require of them. Now let's move to the second point our loving commitment to God. Our loving commitment to God. Again, verse 28. Now we are to note that this verse talks about God's love. And it talks about not those who are loved by God, but those who love God. Do you catch the difference? All things work together, not for those who are loved by God, but for those who love God. That implies that God will love you. And yet, if you don't love God, 
all things will not work for your good. And that does not mean God does not love you. It simply means you do not love God. Now take note again of what that passage has not said. It does not say all things work together for good to those who use God. Because there are people who don't love God, but they use God. And for them, all things do not work for their good. Many of these are preachers, and the Bible tells us that their God is their, is their stomach. So they don't love God, they only use him to satisfy their real God, which is their stomach. And we have many people like that. Some of them keep changing you from one church to another. Because they are looking for a church that will help them to serve that their God. Do you understand? But all things work together. Not for those who are loved by God, but for those who love God. And God ensures that for this group who love him, all things work for their good. Remember what God is primarily committed to, he is committed to his purposes. And because these ones who love him are committed to that purpose, and since he is committed to his purposes eternally, his commitment to them is an eternal commitment to do good to them. Now, Paul reminds us to love God is to seek his good. That is his purposes. He loves those who are called according to what? His purposes. Our love for God becomes glaringly clear, becomes very clear when the pursuit of his purposes is our main goal. That is when our love for God becomes very, very clear. In fact, the clearest place it, is sheer, it shines is when the pursuit of God's purposes now threatens to cost us everything we have and even our lives. So when the pursuit of God's purposes now threatens, now threatens to cost my job, to cost my marriage, to cost my life, and I still stick out for those purposes, greater love has no one than this, that a man should lay down his life for his friend. So when love for God and commitment to his purposes brings us to that point where the question is, are we ready to lose everything because of love for God? And we say yes. Then at that point, we have proven that the love for God truly consumes us. This is where God's, our love for God shines. This is where Jesus shone. This was the experience of Jesus, especially during his trials and crucifixion. In fact, at this time, it even looks at it as if even God himself is against Jesus. Right? You are pursuing God's purpose. 
and the pursuit of God's purpose now puts you in the corner where it looks at if even God himself is against you. Everybody seems to be against you and it looks as if even God is against you. And so for Jesus, I would say, uh, he claims that uh, God is his father, right? Let him do what? Deliver him. So, the pursuit of God's purposes can lead us to that corner where it looks as if even God is against us. And sometimes, even like Jesus, we may have to ask, why have you forsaken me? But it is at such times that our love for God shines forth. And we have to understand that his love for those who love him and are called according to his purposes is eternal. This love is eternal. And so when we walk through such times and it even costs our lives, that loss, that love has not ended because we have died. It simply ushers us into another phase of that love. In fact, because it is eternal, this love, loving commitment to us, because of our commitment to his purposes, is eternal. Like the psalmist, we can say with certainty, surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me. Not just all the days of my life, but we can add, like the psalmist, that we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Of course, his love we abide all the days of our lives. In fact, the, if the pursuit of his purposes leads us to the point where we have to sacrifice everything we've got for him and die, he will stand in love supervising our death like he did the case of Stephen. His love will endure with us all the days of our life, even to the point of our last breath. But it will not stop there. And we shall dwell with him forever and ever. Like Paul, the apostle in Romans, he where we have read, we can now say, who shall separate us from the love? of Christ shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword as it is written for your sake we face death all day long we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered verse 37 no in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Again, this, what Paul is saying is just a logical outcome of the common knowledge of disciples. We know that all things work together. Should it be sword? Should it be famine? We know that all things work together and nothing can separate us from this love 
we know. Now we can courageously take all these things, knowing that whatever happens, all of them are working for our greatest God. And this leads us to our third point. God's love, God's love guaranteeing actions. God's love guaranteeing actions. From 28 to 34. God's love guaranteeing actions. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. In order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. That what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who? is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. God's love guaranteeing actions. Now God loves us, but his love does not stop with a commitment. It goes into actions that guarantee that love. And the passage we have read lists a few of those actions. One of those, okay, before I even go into the specific actions, Paul mentions something. He says, God does all these actions on the basis of his foreknowledge. But what did God foreknow? Let's look at it, verse 29. What did God foreknow? For those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Now, what did God foreknow? Now, take note of this. It does not begin with predestination. It begins with what? Foreknowledge. God foreknew before he predestined. Now, what did he foreknow? He foreknew those who will love him. Do you hear that? Did I say he predestined those who will love him? He did what? He foreknew those who will love him. Not that he predestined those who will love him. And there is a big difference. Whether someone loves God or does not love God is whose responsibility? It's whose responsibility? It's that person's responsibility. God simply foreknew those 
who will love him. Now, because he foreknew and foreknowledge, though it's an active verb, it's also stative, it's also a state, right? It's not an action. It's a state in God. So, it's not what God does. It's simply what part of what God is. Part of God is simply to foreknow. He does not need to think to foreknow. He just knows. But you see, all these love guaranteeing actions are coming from that base of his foreknowledge. So because he foreknew those who will love him, then the love guaranteeing actions follow one after another. The first of them in the text is predestination. Because he knew ahead of time that this person will love him, this person will love him, this person will love him. He now predestined that all these who will love him should be conformed to the image of his son. Do we understand? So he knows that Mr. A will love him, Mr. B will love him, and he says, okay, all these who will love me, this is, these are the limits I have marked for them. That's actually the sense of predestination. If you love me, then one of those first things that will show your love for me is to accept Jesus. Do you understand? That's one thing God predestined that all those who will love him, this is what will happen to them. So, you accept the Lord Jesus Christ. So, once you accept Jesus Christ, the next thing is to be conformed to his image. The word the Bible uses here for image has the sense, in fact, is the word for icon. But the sense here is that which represents something and demonstrates it. Do you understand? It represents that particular thing and demonstrates that thing. So, this is different from saying uh, this person is like this person. In fact, the understanding here is that the representation necessarily comes from that particular thing it represents. So, Without that thing it represents, it is impossible to have the order. Because this one is coming from that one. So, some of the places in the Bible where this is used, for instance, the face of uh, Caesar on the coin. Right? So, without Caesar... Will you have the face of Caesar on the coin? So God had predestined that all those who will love him should accept Christ. And when they accept Christ, the face of Christ should come upon them. They should now begin to take on the image of who? Of Christ. And as they, they increasingly take on the image of Christ, then what Paul says becomes very evidently clear. Christ 
becomes the firstborn amongst many brothers. And the difference between us and Christ is not so wide. Because look, we are taking on his image. So when he stands and we stand with him, we are looking like him. He is the firstborn among many brothers. And so God predestined on the basis of his foreknowledge that all those who would love him will accept Christ and then take on his image. Take note of this. The question that may be hanging around now will be, what about those who live before Christ? What about those? Well, as we talk about the next uh, actions, we will understand. Now, Vine uh, say, has this to say. Sorry. This reminds us clearly why as Christians we cannot live thoughtless lives every day. Why? Because we are predestined to take on a, a particular image, right? But it goes just beyond that. In fact, for all of us, who love God and are in Christ Jesus, God had already predetermined even our daily activities. Paul tells us that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God had determined ahead of time that we should walk in them. It is, in fact, in working in those daily activities that I increasingly take on the image and likeness of Christ. So every day I wake up, I should know that God has a line up of activities for my life. That he expects me that day to do what? To walk in them. And so as a Christian, I cannot be thoughtless. And that's why Paul keeps on saying we should not be thoughtless. We should be thoughtful. In fact, we should always seek to know what the way of the Lord is. And this is in every matter of our everyday life. We should seek to know what the will of the Lord is. And then, we should redeem the time because the days are evil. This understanding of predestination means that as Christians, we cannot be careless. We cannot be careless. Do you understand the basis of our predestination is what? God's foreknowledge. And it's not an act in God. It's a state in God. So it's not that God has to wake up and think through every activity I will have to go through that day. He simply knows everything that I will face that day. And because he knows everything I will face that day, he has a particular will, right? In everything I should do that day. And even when times are hard, it's temptations. In every temptation, he will provide a way out. In every one. 
So if I am the Christian who is spiritually conscious, when I face difficult times, I will ask, Lord, which way are you providing for me out of this? So on the basis of God's predestination, we cannot be careless Christians. Now, the second love guaranteeing act of God is calling. That's the second in our passage, calling. Now, this calling is the actual invitation to those God for knew would love him to accept and be part of and actualize the kingdom of God under the leadership of Christ. Now, this is what is meant by calling. The actual invitation to all these people who love God to accept, be part of the kingdom, and to actualize the kingdom with Christ as the king of the kingdom. Notice God had arranged that whenever, wherever these people will live, they will receive this call. Whenever, wherever they live, they will receive this call. Take note, I said whenever. Some live before Christ, but they received this call. Paul reminds us that God foreseen, right, these things, preached the gospel ahead to who? To Abraham, right? It was the gospel that was preached to Abraham. When was that? Before or after Christ? Before. God had determined that whenever, wherever these people who will love him will live, they will hear, they will receive the call of the gospel. And so, the calling is that extension of the invitation for these ones. And simply because God is not causing them to love him, he simply knew that they will love him. Whenever the invitation comes, what do they do? They jump on. God did not cause anyone to reject him. He did not cause anyone to love him. He simply knew what decisions people will make. Now notice again, this call, was he, is he sent only to those God knew will love him? The answer is no. And so the gospel the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. So even those who don't love him, we have no excuse. They cannot say that God, you gave this good news, you sent this gospel only to those who will love you. If I had heard it, even though you say you knew I will not love you. If I have heard it, if I had heard it, I would have loved you. Do you understand? So the invitation, the call, is given to everyone. But God knows those who will respond. He is not causing them to respond. But he knows that they 
will respond. This is on the basis of God's foreknowledge. Vine has this to say. The purpose of God, his foreknowledge, and his foreordination precede the call. To stand in the call of God means to be justified and to have a part in the glory of Christ with the goal of being conformed to the image of the Son of God. To a certain extent, the sum of the Pauline statement about the call is contained in Romans 8, 26 to 30. However, the radical statement of the apostle's theology of grace is given from the very first of his writings. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul reminds the members of the church of his exhortation to walk worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and to glory. Paul then gives the assurance, he who calls you is faithful and he will do it. God stands by his salvific decree and his call is not void. Even if adversities in the life of the believer call it into question. Now, this is what Vine says. God stands by his salvific decree, and his call is not empty. Even if adversities in the life of the believer call it into question. So this is God's call. A call to belong to Christ to be part of the kingdom, to become and to actualize the kingdom. What a calling. What a calling. The next of God's love guaranteeing actions is justification. Justification. This is God's acceptance of those who would love him on account of their acceptance of the call extended to them in Christ Jesus. Again, this is God's acceptance of those who would love him on account of their acceptance of the call extended to them in Christ Jesus. On account of Christ, God accepts this to be righteous and declares them to be so. So it's not just that he accepts them as righteous, he also declares them to be righteous. In fact, that is why as uh, Paul said elsewhere, he tells the Christians to walk worthy of their calling. They are already accepted as righteous and declared to be righteous. So if they leave anything apart from this, they are no longer worthy, worthy, working worthy of their calling. God so arranged that those who would love him will upon accepting the call in the gospel be justified by him. The next love guaranteeing action of God is glorification. Glorification. God took it upon himself to glorify those he knew will love him. Uh, 
Oh, God glorifying someone. All along, we give God the glory. But God took it upon himself to glorify those who will love him. After their justification, he decided that they would be granted a resounding welcome in the kingdom of God, namely Christ. That they would be decorated with crowns, that they would shine like stars, that they would reign with him and even judge angels. In fact, these are simply clues coming here and there. Just giving us ideas of what that glorification will look like. Do you know why this is not a full picture? No eye has seen. No ear has heard. Neither has it entered the mind of man what God has prepared for those who love him. And in fact, as I was studying this scripture, I discovered something. That God is deliberately hiding this part. It's deliberate. God is hiding this part of how he is going to glorify those who love him. It's a deliberate thing. Listen to what John says. First John chapter 3 Verse 2 to 3. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. So this is one part of that which God decides to keep close to himself. To keep and hide. And say, I will bring this out only on that day. So what we see in the Bible of God's plan to glorify those who love him are simply mentions here and there and there. But the whole package, he is keeping close to his heart. Do you want to see it? Get there. Get there. When the apostles agree on this, Paul says, no eye has seen. John says, what we will be has not yet been made known. How about God? He is keeping this close to his heart. No wonder, even for Daniel, whom he spoke and said, oh, my highly esteemed. Daniel said, please, permission to look into those things when Christ, are we? God said, this one is not for your time. Seal it. This part God is keeping close to himself. And when we get there, then we will see God roll out everything he's got. What is it that Jesus is working on all this while? In my father's house, there are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. What is it that Jesus has been working on for all this while? Oh, 
the depth and the breadth and the height of God's love. It's unfathomable, it's beyond comprehension. By and by, when the morning comes, when the saints of God shall be gathered home, we will tell the story how we love. We will understand it better. And the apostles understanding this, remember, he says, this we know. He said, our temporal suffering, our fleeting suffering, our momentary sufferings are preparing for us a glory that far await, outweigh them all. They just knew that even to them, this was not revealed. God held this package to himself. Peter talks about this and says, this thing that God has prepared for us uh, is incorruptible. It does not fail, right? It does not perish. It does not spoil. Where is it kept? It is kept in heaven before him. Hi. You say, we are moths. And thieves cannot break in. Haba. And he is very clear. Peter adds, he's kept in heaven for who? For who? For you. Brother and sister, if you were to go there, your name is already hanging somewhere. Is God's love guaranteeing acts. It's already hanging there. And God has packaged the surprise that his children desire to see, but he says, wait. Just know that with all I've got, I'll prepare the surprise for you. Wait patiently and cross over. This is a surprise. But this is even not the last of God guaranteeing acts in the passage. In fact, Paul goes on to talk about Christ dying for us. Even the death of Christ is part of God's love guaranteeing acts. And Paul will say, if he did not hold back his only son, but gave him for us. What will he hold back from us? Even the death of Christ is one of God's love guaranteeing acts. But it's not just that. Paul even goes on to tell us that Christ is not even done. He is seated at the right hand of God, doing what? Interceding for us. How about? How better can it get? How better can it get? That the one who loves me more than I love myself and gave himself for me, seeks to intercede for me. How better can it get? God's love guaranteeing acts. 
And all of these simply ensure that we take hold of everything that God in love has determined for us. But as I round up, we have to remember God's eternal commitment to his purposes ensures that what? All who love him will not only be proved right, but we also be glorified. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, neither has it entered the minds of man what God has prepared for those who love him. We know that he is able to do what? Exceedingly, abundantly, above all, that we ever think or imagine. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? What are you expecting to see when you cross over? You cannot even imagine it. Because whatever you imagine, he is able to do exceedingly. It's not just exceedingly, oh abundantly. It's not just abundantly. Above. Abba. He is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all Hi. that we ever think or imagine. The apostles understanding this will say, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Let us pray. How will you want to respond to the Lord? He works in all things, in all things. He works for those who love him. Not necessarily those he loves, but those who love him. Have you made that commitment of love to him? To love him with all you've got. And that's what opens the door for you to begin to comprehend the love he has for you. If you think you've not made that commitment, this is the opportunity. And it's in your hand. You can take it. And Lord, as we walk through this journey, this journey of faith in this evil and corrupt generation, where things don't always go according to your way, but yet in all of it you see you walk out your way. We pray for courage to be conscious spiritual Christians as we move in our, on our Christian journey. Lord, grant that when Christ comes, he will see that he has many brothers and sisters who look like him. And we will be counted amongst them. Thank you for hearing us. This we pray in Jesus' name. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son 
into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Go in peace and the Lord bless you today and always. And let's live in the love that God has bestowed upon us. The offering bags are there as we exit the church. God bless you.